Today we are working our way through, through the book of 1 Thessalonians. Uh, we are in 1 Thessalonians as we were last week. Uh, today we're in chapter 2, verses 1 to 8. Just a short little bit of uh, scripture for today's sermon. Uh, so Terry, you're going to hope it's a short sermon, right? Uh, uh, you don't know, you might get lucky today. Maybe, maybe you're lucky today, today, who knows. Paul's ministry in Thessalonica. Um, is the, what the uh, New Revised Standard Version calls this section of Scripture. The last time we were through the lectionary, I preached over this one as well. So that was three years ago. The lectionary goes on a three-year cycle. And it just happened to be that the last time we preached through this, it was just right after Gail's mother's passing. Uh, and this was, I believe, the sermon I gave the week after Mary Allison's funeral. And I talked about her funeral and that. And so, given that, I will dedicate this sermon to your mom's memory. Uh, so, with that, let's look at verses two, or excuse me, verses one through eight in the second chapter of First Thessalonians. You yourselves know, brothers and sisters, that our coming to you was not in vain. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully mistreated at Philippi, as you know. We had courage in our Lord and our God to declare to you the gospel of God in spite of great opposition. For our appeal does not spring from deceit or impure motives or trickery, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the message of the gospel, even so we speak, not to please mortals, but to please God, who tests our hearts. As you know, and as God is our witness, we never came with words of flattery or with a pretext for greed. Nor did we seek praise from mortals, whether from you or from others, though we might have made demands as apostles of Christ, though we were gentle among you, like a nurse tenderly caring for her own children. So deeply do we care for you that we are determined to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also ourselves, because you have become very dear to us. We will do this in the fashion that I tend to like to preach, and that will be to just go through this verse by verse in an expository manner. You yourselves know, brothers and sisters, that our coming to you was not in vain. Remember last week we said that Paul and, and Silas and Timothy, they were only in Thessalonica, maybe tops, three weeks. They were there for three Sabbaths. Probably more like two weeks, two and a half weeks that they were there. Not a long time. One could think that that wasn't time to do anything, to accomplish anything. But here Paul proclaims that their coming was not in vain. And in fact, it wasn't in vain. That short period of time sparked a church that kept going for many, many years. It sparked a church that if we were somehow, and I've talked before about our Christian genealogy, if you will, that, you know, you go through all of this intermeshing of all of the different contacts and the connections we've had, and we've all had some of the same connections, but we've all had different connections with different Christians. And I would present to you that if you could somehow work through that, which is virtually impossible, I don't know how you would do that, if you would go through that, more than likely, we all have connections to that church somehow. Probably multiple connections to that church through all of these generations of Christians that have been since. And at one time I talked about my, my great, I think it was my great grandmother 51 times was Budisha, of, that was a, was a queen in Wales. Um, and she was 51, 53 generations on the back. But she was alive at the time Jesus was alive. So that's really all you need to get back there. It's 50, 51, 53, whatever. Leaves probably less than that, to be honest. So we're closer to Jesus than we sometimes think we are. When we talk about that 2,000 years. It was not in vain. Not at all. But though we had suffered and been shamefully mistreated at Philippi, as you know, we had courage in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in spite of great opposition. To be a Christian today 
be a Christian at any time, really, but perhaps especially today. More so in America now than maybe any time in America, you're going to get an opposition. Some of us, I know Gary gets online and talks to people online, you get people that come up against you. You get people that speak out against you, people that will say all kinds of derogatory, nasty things. And if you wither away at the very first one of those, what kind of a mission, mission, ministry rather, have you had? If Paul would have withered away the first time somebody said something mean to him, would we have the gospel that we have today? Paul, Paul was responsible for most of the New Testament, guys and gals. Either he wrote it, or somebody he knew wrote it, wrote it, or somebody he influenced wrote it. There's only a few gospel or a few books in the in the canon of the New Testament that Paul didn't have some input into, some connection to. In fact, he might have had connection to all of them. If he would have withered away the first time somebody said, Well, you're just being foolish following that supposed guy that rose from the dead, what kind of craziness is that? Where would we be today? Where will the generations be from now to Christ comes again? If the first time somebody says something mean to us or hurts our feelings, we shut up and we stop spreading the gospel. Paul was stoned. Paul was beaten. Paul was shipwrecked. Paul was hungry and thirsty and all of those things and ultimately killed for the gospel. And he never shut up. For our appeal does not spring from deceit or impure motives or trickery. The reason he's coming is he's telling them is genuine. It's not self-serving. And we need to remember that. Do we present the gospel to people to be self-serving? Hopefully not. The word there, impure, is greatly softened in the English. It invokes a dimension of licentiousness. And hopefully you know that because we've got children room, I'm not going to go into that word, but it's not a good thing. Very impure motives or trickery. But just as we have been approved by God and entrusted with the message of the gospel, even so we speak not to please mortals, but to please God who tests our hearts. Because we're not trying to find accolades from human beings, we say the truth. If you're in, it, in this world and you're following Christ so the people pat you on the back and say what a good boy or girl you are and what, how great you are and wonderful you are, that's not the right reason. We're here because that judgment day that we've talked about before, when we stand before the Lord, we want to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. Not, go away from me. I never knew you. That's the only approval we seek. And if that means that we live a lifetime of disapproval from human beings, so be it. Because this life in this world is very finite. We never know when we're going to come up, our number is going to come up. And we've seen a lot of death in this Lake City area in the last month and a half, two months. And that should remind us that none of us knows when our time is coming from one week to the next, we might find out that our days are numbered. Don't miss a chance to spread the gospel. As you know, and as God is our witness, we never came with words of flattery or with pretenses for greed, nor did we seek praise from mortals, whether from you or from others. And he's kind of reiterating what he said before. We're not here for human praise. We're here to speak the truth. 
We're not here to hear your hear others praise. But we might have made demands as apostles of Christ, but we were gentle among you, like a nurse tenderly caring for her own children. Paul and them did not ask for subsistence at all. They, now, they, they were supported in their ministry by some of the church. The church in Philippi supported them at times. But they didn't ask necessarily for that. And they were gentle. Now, one has to wonder, how in the world was Paul gentle with the church in Thessalonica when he was only there for three weeks? The last time I preached over this, I talked about using the, the, uh, the, the uh, metaphor of a car and how fast you have to drive to get from point A to B, and that if you're doing pulpit supply, sometimes you preach pretty hard and fast, and you go from zero to 60 just like that because you've got to get to the destination. When you're in a settled pulpit, you tend to build on, let sermons build from one to the next. And even though my wife hates it when I say, as we've talked about before, when I say that, that's part of the process of building and layering and reminding. And because we all need to be reminded of things. Even though we know it, we have to be reminded of it. But Paul was gentle, even though he got them there quickly. So let's remember that when we're talking to people. At times, we might be tempted to tell somebody, you're going to hell, a handbasket. But sometimes you tell somebody, you're going to hell, they're going to shut down. They're not going to listen anymore. So somehow, Paul gently let these people know that they needed to turn their backs on idols, pagan worship, that word back there that uh, means impure, they had to move away from the, 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 some of the worship they did at the temples that had that very much impure impetus behind it. But yet somehow Paul was able to do it gently. And maybe that's a prayer that we should have. Maybe that's a prayer that I should have to somehow be able to convey the word effectively and gently and lovingly but not take away from the truth. Because it's not loving to let someone live a life of sin. It's not loving to let someone continue in a lifestyle that's going to get them into the wrong place at judgment. You need to remember that. It's not unloving to preach the gospel, but you can preach the gospel in an unloving way. And let's do our best to find that loving way. So deeply do we care for you that we are determined to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our self, own selves, excuse me, because you have become very dear to us. And therein, in that last verse, is part of the reason why I would dedicate this to Mary Alice. Because Gail's mother was the epitome good Christian woman that lived a devout life. And I spoke at her funeral and I confess in that sermon that I gave at her funeral it was a sermon, it was, a, it was a, a, you know, a, a eulogy but at the same time it was a sermon that I preached to her grandchildren, to be blunt. That they needed to follow the witness of their grandmother. That they needed to remember the witness of their grandmother because she lived an entire life that was a witness. It was a gentle witness, and perhaps maybe too gentle in some ways, but she lived such a wonderful witness to everyone that knew her, because of all the hardships she endured as a, as a child and as a woman, but yet she never ever gave up her faith. She always knew that God was there for her, that's the kind of witness we need to live, people. Look at your life. Are you living that kind of life? And if you're not, today's the day to make that change. We all need to hear that. I need to hear that. Let's all live a life of witness. Let's give our own, not only give the gospel to people, but give them our love.
Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much for the message of Paul here to the church in Thessalonica, but it speaks to us, Lord, across the centuries. We need to remember to be faithful, but we need to remember to be loving and gentle. We need to remember that the gospel is worth all the suffering that we might endure to preach it, and that your people, that your people, which is all people, need to hear how much you love them, how much you gave up for them, that you came into this world, that you died on the cross, you suffered and were risen and rose again to pay for our sins, to redeem our eternal souls, that we might reside with you in heaven. Praise be to God. Amen.